It's been a while since this happened, but for legal reasons I was not allowed to talk publicly about it due to the severity of the event. I have been granted permission to speak publicly about it though. There's no news story about it, at least not yet anyway. I'm a 21 year old male and it was the 4th of July 2019. I live in Kansas in the USA and at the time I worked on the night shift as a corrections officer at a maximum security prison. The cell house I was in charge of was the maximum general population, one man to a cell. This is where murderers, rapists and overall the worst of society were housed. Before work I was doing the typical American 4th of July thing, grilling, blowing up fireworks, had a beer or two and was having a great time with my now wife and family. My wife kept telling me I needed to just call in sick and take the day without pay, but I said no because we were a little behind on bills. I really wish I had listened to her now. As the night went on, it came time for us to leave my mum's and for me to go home and get ready for work. I took my wife home and dropped her off, got ready and left for work. My wife's car was broken down, so she was stuck at home for the night. As I drove to work, which was about an hour's drive away, I watched the fireworks going off all around. It was sad, I had never had to work on the 4th before. After I got to work and got all my equipment, I went into my cell house. It was business as usual. Inmates were showered and locked up, and I had my night cleaning crew out so they could clean the rest of the cell house. I met up with my partner for the night in the officer station to get our briefing from the last shift. Now fast forward an hour into my shift. It's now around 12.30am and another officer came into the cell house. So now there were three of us. This happened often on a night shift as there was nothing to do except rounds every half an hour or so. Then suddenly out of nowhere we heard an inmate laughing like a witch, like a cackle. It was strange but nothing to be alarmed about. Drugs were a bad problem in that facility and still are as far as I know. Eventually after a few more cackles I decided to go and see who was making the sound in case they were high. I gradually walked through and checked all 200 inmates and found nothing. There were a small few that were awake, but I brushed it off and just went back to my office. My partner and the other officer were asking if there was anyone that needed cells searched, but I couldn't think of anyone in particular that I suspected of having anything, so I went and checked all the cells again to see if I could get a whiff of any smoke or see something. As I was walking on the second story cell run, I found an inmate that was acting weird. He was in his bed facing the wall and talking. This was also common as there were a lot of inmates with minor mental issues. I figured he was high because he turned and looked at me and told me to fuck off. I was going to leave him alone, but the disrespect made me change my mind. The time is now 12.40am on the 5th of July. I walked back to the office and told the other two officers which Sally was in and I wanted him searched, cell 218. So how the cell house is laid out is there are 100 cells per level. From the officer station you can see the north side, first and second floor, but you can't see the south side unless you walk the 50 feet over to it. Picture the movie Shawshank Redemption type cell house, except instead of being able to look through and see cells across, you just see a wall. The cells are literally back to back. As the officers go to pull him out of his cell to search it, I went to the ground floor and was watching from below. The reason why was because I wanted to get the inmate onto the ground level and not the second floor. All that was there for protection from going over the edge was a handrail. I noticed the inmate was taking forever to get out of his cell. 
He came out in shorts and a do-rag, which is weird because he wasn't fully clothed. He didn't even put his sandals on, just shorts and a do-rag. Yet it took five minutes for him to come out, and that made me nervous. The inmate was a six-foot-tall, 250-pound, muscle-bound dude, so he definitely had size on us. So from the ground, I holler at him and told him to come down to the ground, and that he could use the phone and check his email or commissary. He declined my offer, which never happens, so I knew something was up. He was watching them search his cell from the control panel box. This was alarming. They were in his cell, I was on the ground, and he could have easily ambushed them. He would have made it to them before I could get up the stairs, so to try to keep them safe I went upstairs to the inmate. He was standing in the corner, away against the handrail, at the top of the stairs. He knew I was the OIC, officer in charge, of that cell house, and he knew I was the one that saw him talking to himself. He asked me why I was having his cell searched. I lied and said, It's nothing personal, man. I have a quota I have to fill, for cells searched in the night, and you were awake, so I chose you to have searched. It'll just take a second. He was uneasy and pacing. Something wasn't right. Then I saw it. He had turned right and I saw in his do-rag, the Samsung logo was reflecting the cell house light. Shit, I knew there was going to be a problem as soon as I saw it. He had a cell phone. I called over the radio for two additional officers to come to me. The inmate didn't seem to notice I'd made the call, and my supervisors responded saying two of them were on their way. A side note. At this time only segregation officers had protective vests, so out to the five of us that were now in there, only one had a vest. I was not that one. The officers were South, who had a vest, McCormick, Collins, Sheffield and me. The time is now 12.58am. As soon as South and McCormick got up to me, I told the inmate to turn around and cough up. South and McCormick were on the right of the inmate and I was in front of him. Why? he asked angrily. I refused to give him a reason at first. After a few minutes, I had enough and I told him, Look man, I can see the cell phone in your do-rag. You know you're not supposed to have that. A defeated look crosses the inmate's face, but there was fire in his eyes. His body relaxes and he slowly reaches up to retrieve the phone. But does he pull out a phone? No. He pulls out a six-inch sharpened metal rod with ripped fabric wrapped around the bottom as a handle. I completely froze. I knew I was going to die. Everything started moving again, and I now have an inmate twice my size charging me and thrusting quickly and repeatedly towards me. Oh shit, was all I managed to yell. I immediately went into defensive mode, trying to grab his arm and disarm him. His wrist kept slipping so I couldn't keep hold of it, but at least I managed to block his attempts at my lower abdomen. Suddenly he aimed high and went for my chest. I felt it make contact. I had just been stabbed in the right part of my chest. Spray him! I yelled at the top of my lungs. McCormick was already working on spraying the MK9 OC spray. For my military readers, you know what I mean. For others, MK9 comes as a pressured spray bottle, about 20 fluid ounces. You can buy it at camping stores in the USA. It's called bear spray, as it's the stuff that you spray into a bear's eyes so you can get away. South had come up behind the inmate and grabbed him around his chest and pulled him backwards right as McCormick sprayed him, and pulled him backwards right as McCormick sprayed. I didn't realise it at the time, but the spray hit me, the inmate, and South as well as everything near us. I was able to turn and run so I ran around the stair railing, past the panel box and out onto the run of cells on the second storey. I ran past a few cells and turned around to see he wasn't chasing me but South was wrestling him to the ground while gagging on the OC, as was I and McCormick. Sheffield, having heard the commotion, came running out of the cell, saw what was happening and ran in to help. The inmate grabbed South by the vest and tried to throw him over the end of the landing, but South dropped to his knees before he went over. I grabbed my shoulder mic and screamed into it. Level A response to Charlie 2, now! Dispatch said something back, but I didn't hear it. I started to charge back to help save South, but before I could get away from the cell, I was in front of Collins. He grabbed me from behind and told me not to go due to the layout of the runs I didn't see, but Sheffield grabbed the inmate from behind and body slammed him onto his face and began cuffing him. Sheffield got covered in OC as well due to the inmates being covered in it. 
As soon as Collins let me go, I stood still and watched. Up the stairs came four more officers, the captain and a lieutenant. The lieutenant came and asked me what had happened. I started to explain, but he cut me off after he saw blood coming out of my left arm. After taking me out of the cell house, he made me lift my shirt, because he'd seen the blood. He examined all my wounds, and he had me remove all my equipment and hold paper towels to my arm. I was rushed to the ER, and I was able to grab my phone out of my rental car. It was a rental because I had totaled my car a few weeks previously by hitting a deer. I called my wife and told her what had happened, and she called my parents and siblings. Luckily, my injuries weren't too bad. I was stabbed four times once on my left arm just below the elbow. That was a through and through. Blade went in one side and out the other. Twice in the top of my left hand, and the one hit in my chest went in the skin and hit one of my ribs, keeping it out of my lungs. Out of 37 plunges, I think it's safe to say I'm lucky to be here writing this story. I didn't sleep for two days following the event, and I still have nightmares almost daily. I'm always paranoid. I openly carry a gun now. After my attack, I was forced to resign for safety reasons. Everyone statewide that works in Max prisons now has vests. None of the people from there talk to me anymore, and I feel abandoned. I have one guy from that facility that I still see who was my sergeant, who wasn't there that night. Court is coming soon to add three more attempted murders on the guy. Turns out he was a shot caller for the Crips gang. If you readers would like to see the wounds, let me know in the comments. It's from the day after the attack and after they had scabbed up. I'll post them except for the one on my chest. Stay safe, everyone. If any law enforcement guys read this, watch your six and never be afraid to have backup. And to the fucker that stabbed me, I hope for your sake that we never meet again aside from court, because I have a hollow point with your name scratched into it. When I was much younger and far less concerned with consequences, I was introduced to a guy through a mutual friend that was well connected. It took me forever to figure out how this guy could stock a veritable roving pharmacy in his vehicle, but at the time I wasn't so much concerned with the how, just the when. Like, hey man, when can I purchase an irresponsible amount of diverted prescription medications from you? As I got to know him more, I learned more about the purveyor of happy pills, and he thoroughly threw off a bad vibe. I would do my absolute best to avoid the post-deal hangout, but the guy was clearly and completely socially maladroit. Eventually, Dealer, I'll henceforth refer to him as D, starts attempting to insinuate himself into my group of friends more and more. He would call me constantly, text me like an abandoned Tinder date, and generally harass me to hang out. We would be casually drinking beer in the backyard of my house, and he'd happen to be in the neighbourhood just like he'd accidentally take a load off and decide to stick around. I am not a complete asshole, so it was difficult to sell someone a clue who doesn't have a proverbial nickel to his name. I specifically remember a night when each of us were recounting macho stories of tussles and scrapes we'd been in, and Dee decided it was his turn to contribute. It went something like this. Oh, that's nothing, man. One time I shot a man in the face with a sawn-off shotgun and beat the rap on a self-defence technicality. We all sort of went slack-jawed at this moment and nodded our heads, mumbling uncomfortably. Wow, pretty cool. At that point, I think we all just assumed he was a one-upper, and would say whatever to reinforce the tough guy persona he was so desperate to have us believe. I should have realised then that maybe D wasn't exactly an asset to the societal fabric, but, you know, I didn't want to hurt the guy's feelings. Plus, drugs. A few weeks later into the summer, some of the boys and I decide to tie one down and head downtown to the clubs. Now I know for a fact that I hadn't committed the felonious sin of imparting knowledge of our physical location to D, but somehow he materialised by my side as I was ordering a drink. Even in my own greatly impaired state, I could tell D was in a knee-walking, gutter-sucking blackout. It took me all of thirty seconds of surveying his slack expression coupled with those glassy black eyes doing the thousand-yard stare, to surmise that Dee was not going to be a fun man to be around on this night. My hypothesis soon proved all too accurate when he began pushing random people on the dance floor, 
accosting women in front of their respective boyfriends and husbands, all the while fiddling around in his pockets for something. Are you starting to understand why Dee wasn't a pillar of social proficiency? Eventually he was ejected from the club, and as a mission of pure mercy I went outside to make sure he at least found a cab home. That's when I discovered what Dee was looking for in his pockets all night. As I walked outside I could see several bouncers warily surrounding this portly whirling dervish of dipshit, as he's brandishing a six-inch serrated fold-out knife at them. I still have no idea what possessed me to step in and corral him, and I still believe that the only reason I wasn't cut to absolute ribbons is because of the gummy-like flexibility I'm afforded under the influence of alcohol and prescription medications. I was finally able to convince him into a taxi and send him packing. At that point I made a firm decision to stop doing drugs, and by proxy stop seeing D. Ever. I blocked his number and refused to go out. It's lucky that I did this too, because some months later he found himself once again in a scuffle at the very same establishment. Only this time I wasn't there to rescue him. He stabbed a man seven or eight times and hot-footed it into an alley in some pitiful attempt at an escape. The police didn't have to do much sleuthing, as there were plenty of bystanders willing to point out his location. Dee is now in a level four prison and isn't eligible for parole another decade or so. And I say good. D, let's not fucking meet again. To give you some background, I'm from a city in the northeast of Scotland in the UK, and what happened here didn't just affect me, but also two of my close friends, who for the purposes of this story we will call Debbie and Joe. We all used to work in a virgin megastore. I started there back in 2003, Debbie joined in 2006, and Joe joined us in 2007. The entire staff of the store for the best part were all close friends. We were all music and movie nerds, so shared the same interests and sense of humour, etc. Every year over the Christmas period, we would take on temporary staff as extra help for the volume of customers we would get at that time of year. In 2007, one of our temps was called Rory. Most of us hit it off with him brilliantly. He was a young guy and seemed really passionate about music, especially Pink Floyd, which was a big win with Joe and I. Joe is one of the greatest guitarists I've ever met and I grew up on Pink Floyd through my parents. Rory was a budding filmmaker and his love of movies seemed to match his love of music, so he would have a lot to chat about and became friends very quickly. It was rare to keep in touch with the work temps post-Christmas period, but Rory was an exception. He didn't live in the same city as the rest of us, but kept plenty of contact through texting and social media and would come to the city to hang out from time to time. Moving forward to Christmas 2008, by this point, the Virgin Megastore we worked in had become Zavi Entertainment, and Rory came back to work with us as a temp, in particular with me. I ran the stockroom in the store, which was the busiest place at Christmas time, and had a history of having not so great people to help with the big amount of work that would need doing, so I was happy to be getting someone I knew would work hard and that I could have banter with. He could be a bit annoying at times, though, trying to force different live versions of the same Pink Floyd song he'd found on the internet. As I said, I love Pink Floyd, but I love a lot of music. Nevertheless, I just figured, ah, he's young and he's passionate, but he's cool. Now around this time, he had started to put together a self-made Pink Floyd documentary, which he'd interviewed me and Joe for. And to be honest, he did a fucking great job, given the limited tools that he had. Zavi closed in February 2009 due to the global credit crunch at the time. All the Zavi staff and Rory kept in touch as we'd all become very close working there, like I said. Fast forward to summer 2010, when we had a Zavi reunion night out, which Rory had organised. Most of us that still lived in the same city managed to make it along. Joe had moved to Glasgow at this point. It was a really fun night out and Rory stayed at my place. I should point out that at this point Rory was preparing to go to America for his second year, working as a counsellor for Camp America at Camp Wigwam in Maine, Ohio. Since Zavi closed, I'd gotten a new job doing the same thing at another entertainment retail store, and that Christmas Rory came to work there as a temp, which I was initially fine with. 
Moving into 2011 and Rory started to raise red flags, although at the time I didn't see it clearly. He claimed that while in America he'd gotten a job helping with editing and camera work on the show Burn Notice. At the time I was like, oh wow, that's cool man, well done. It didn't seem unbelievable given I knew he had talent in filmmaking. Coinciding with this, he claimed he was working for Camp America in Florida, which is what led him to working on Burn Notice, where it was at that time being filmed. Then when he was back in Scotland in 2011, it was time for another Zavi reunion, which Rory had to be in charge of, which bothered me as he technically didn't work there when we closed, and like I said, he was only a temp. I got sickened with him posting constantly on Facebook about essentially what was just some old friends going to the pub, and again I was just like, yeah, he's young and easily excited, he's harmless enough. Then another red flag was raised. Rory and another friend who shared an interest in filmmaking were talking about doing a film in the city. They spent the whole day looking at locations, and afterwards when I spoke to Rory he was like, yeah, we're going to do this, this and this, making it sound like they had some exciting ideas. Then when I spoke to my other friend about it, he told me, all Rory did the whole day was ask me about my favourite directors. It was a complete waste of time. Made me think again. Ah, he's young and excitable and has a tendency to exaggerate, but he's harmless. Now to 2012. Debbie, who I mentioned at the start of this story, had become a closer figure in his life. Debbie is a nearly six foot tall blonde bombshell and was at the time one of the nicest people you could ever meet with an amazing sense of humour. We became super close when we worked together, but it was always totally platonic. I always looked at her in more of a sibling way. She would come round to my place for dinner and to watch movies, and I knew all her close friends and a few family members. Herself and Rory went to the cinema a few times and hung out afterwards. Absolutely nothing wrong with that, for now. It's Christmas and Rory is back as a temp for the third year in a row and by this time he has started to annoy the other staff. Whilst on lunch, he'd sit and brag about all the TV shows he'd worked on in his summers in the States. Burn Notice, Criminal Minds, and The Wire. Unfortunately, I didn't hear about this at the time, because people knew I was friendly with him. They didn't want to seem like they were talking shit about him, as the staff in this job were also got along famously. On a personal note, talking with him at work became a bit weird, as he started talking to me in a really smug and condescending tone, which given that I'm six years older than him, had a hand in him getting his temp jobs every year, and thought I was his friend, I didn't appreciate. Then around the same time, there's another savvy night out due. Rory, Debbie, Joe who was visiting from Glasgow, myself and a few others. The day before the said get together, keeping in mind I'm pissed about how Rory is behaving, I get a text from him saying, Hey man, the plan for the night out tomorrow is to go to a pub quiz. Now I don't go to pub quizzes for tedious personal reasons, and all these friends knew this, so Rory was essentially implying the rest of the guys had planned to go to do something I wouldn't go to, which I didn't, and I was super pissed about that text. I kept quiet about it from the others, even though I should have shown how devious he was, because as it turns out those guys didn't go to a pub quiz, and there was no intention to. The next day Joe came into the shop to speak to me since I'd missed the night out, and the whole time I'm talking to him, Rory was standing next to him in a defensive stance, answering everything I asked Joe, like he was his fucking spokesperson. It was infuriating, because I was at work and I couldn't lose my shit. Joe is a happy-go-lucky guy, and he didn't even notice what Rory was doing. Rory was obsessed with Joe because of his talents as a guitar player, to the point of it becoming unhealthy. It was around this time that Debbie started to sense I was having a problem with Rory, and it was true. Contact with him would trigger me to get anxious or angry, because I knew there was something amiss. But Debbie and Joe were constantly just fooled by his false charm, and that's why I kept tolerating him, because I loved those guys and didn't want to be the cause of drama. In early 2013, Rory made out his dad had had a life-threatening stroke, which he subsequently survived, but left him incredibly disabled. This then turned out to be a lie and a tool to get sympathy from Debbie and Joe. It's 2014 and Joe had moved back to town from Glasgow into Debbie's spare room. This is where Rory really starts to phase me out from the group. Despite having recently hung out with me and me having put him up at my place, which I had done several times over the years, he takes Debbie, Joe and another ex-savvy friend to three different Prince gigs around the country. 
Initially, I was super pissed, but in hindsight, I was also relieved. It was Rory that paid for all the tickets for those gigs, which was another red flag. I have to point out that when he wasn't working with me as a temp over Christmas, or in America over the summer working for Camp America and various TV shows, he was making out he was a freelance photographer and video editor, which would be fine, but he didn't have a website, a Facebook page or anything else as far as I could see to contact him to do said work. Taking that into account and the fact he's throwing cash to go to concerts around the UK, I was concerned about where this money was coming from. Following the Prince gigs, I had blocked him on social media as his posts and comments on other people's posts were just annoying, constantly undermining people on what they were saying or arguing with folks having a different opinion to him. Debbie took issue with me blocking him and stuck up for him. In hindsight, she'd been groomed by him and had rose-tinted glasses on when looking at him. I caved and got back in touch with him, even though I know now I should have walked away from them all. But like I said before, I dearly loved Debbie and Joe, and didn't want to lose their friendship, even though I knew deep down there was something bad about Rory. Throughout 2014, Debbie and Rory got super close. Anyone that didn't know them and saw their Facebook pics would think that they were a couple. Over the next two years, my contact with these guys started to drift. Rory would come round to my place for a bit, and then when leaving, he'd be like, I'm away up to darling Debbie's. I would invite you, but you're not one of the three amigos. A lot of the time it turned out that he wasn't actually going there. One time he even came to my place to stay the night and said he needed to catch a flight to the States in the morning to get to a video editing job. I later found out he was just going back to the village to his mum's house. Eventually I walked away quietly. I took Debbie and Joe and Rory off my newsfeed and hid any Facebook posts I made hidden from them. I figured if I'd seen any of them in the street, I'd be polite and just get away ASAP. I then started to investigate Rory's claims about his time in America. I relayed them all to a friend and his flatmate, who himself had lived in America for a long time. They both told me that, nah man, there's no way he could be doing all that shit. Which was true. If you go to the US to work for Camp America, that's all you're allowed to do. And with a bit of research, I found the camp that Rory actually worked at and found out he never actually worked there at all. During this time, I had friends who would still follow him on Facebook, out of intrigue. They would ask me, where is his money coming from? Rory was going to stadium and arena concerts around the UK at least once a week. Some of these gigs cost as much as £200 a ticket, not to mention the travel costs and accommodation. I knew something was up. I knew he wasn't involved in drugs. He would claim that he made money from YouTube, but his channel barely had any subscriptions. Plus all his videos were of copyrighted material, so there was no way he was making money that way. I did wonder if he was making money from editing, but he was avoiding paying tax, so that's the only thing I could think of. Believe me, if I could have afforded a private detective to investigate this guy, I would have. During all this time, Debbie and Joe are hanging out with him and posting how great he is, etc. on Facebook, despite the fact I found Rory had a second Facebook account, where the profile pic was of him and Debbie. This was a secret account, so I took a screenshot and showed Debbie. But she was just like, oh, isn't that his American account? Sorry, Debbie, but you were really fucking stupid. Now let's fast forward to October 2018. By this point, I've severed contact with Rory completely, missed Debbie's wedding the previous year where Rory was a bridesman, and I haven't seen Joe in a good while either. One day I had returned to work after my lunch break that lasted about five minutes. My friend, who was on her lunch too, and in the staff room, came running through to where I was. Hey, have you heard? Rory was in court. Which in itself was initially shocking. I replied, What, for tax evasion or copyright infringement? No, she said, for making videos of little kids. Between January and November 2017, he was pretending to be a girl online, using YouTube and Omegle to groom young boys. I shall leave links to the newspaper reports. Once I was told what he'd done, I was in an adrenaline fueled rage for the next 17 hours. I was just so pissed off that I'd been right. He was a bad guy, but I just couldn't prove it. I knew my friends had been duped, not to mention all those poor kids that got abused by him. As for his expendable income, I really think he was selling the videos he was making on the dark web for Bitcoin profit. 
He was the first person ever to mention the dark web to me. He mentioned that I should never go on it. He pled guilty and got three years and nine months, along with a five-year sexual harm prevention order, and will be on the sex offender's register for the rest of his life. Thanks for listening. I'm still in touch with Joe, although he's a super busy guy these days. Debbie, unfortunately, I'm not in touch with now. I know she was mortified by the revelations, but she's married and happy now, so I'm just glad she saw the truth eventually, even though it took something so heinous to do so. Weird and creepy stuff never happens to me. I live a comfortable life and I avoid any and all possible conflict or abnormalities. This past summer for my graduation gift, my mum and grandma took me to Alberta to go and watch the Spruce Meadows Masters Tournament. If you don't know what that is, it's one of the world's largest horse shows. We flew out there so we decided to use Uber to get to and from the showgrounds. We don't have Uber where I'm from but everyone said the Uber drivers in the area were awesome. For the first three days the drivers were great. They picked us up within five minutes or so and got us there in 15 minutes tops. It's also important to mention that the cars were clean and safe. On day four we called for an Uber 45 minutes before the time we wanted to be picked up at 9.30am. 10am rolled around and we thought we'd give it another 10 minutes before calling for a different driver. Around 10.05 and the driver turns up. In his profile it said that he was driving a 2017 Dodge Journey and when he got there it was definitely the right guy but he was in this old run-down looking beater. My first instinct was to go up to the driver window and ask him to roll it down and before I could ask him his name, just to check to make sure and ask him what happened to the car the app said he would be driving, he almost shouted at me in a very angry tone in reply. Yes, I'm him. This is my sister's car as mine's in the shop. Now get in ladies, I have other riders waiting. I was shocked and scared already at this point, and I looked at my mum and grandma, and they said to just get in, so I did. I sat in the back with my grandma, and my mum sat in the front seat. We told him where we needed to go, and we were on our way. He had taken a different route that he claimed was quicker, taking the highway in Calgary. 15 minutes is already pretty fast. So 15 to 20 minutes had passed and he had been chatting up my mum in a very flirtatious way for the whole ride. He had taken us into the countryside that seemed to be forever away from where we were going. It was actually in the opposite direction, so I asked him if he knew where he was going and if we could get back onto the highway. He ignored me and kept driving. Another 10 minutes later and I was freaking the hell out. My mum was obviously quite uncomfortable as well and we were still in the countryside. He pulled over onto the side of the road and we just sat there for a solid five or six minutes. At this point I was shaking and had to hold my grandma's hand. The driver turned around to put his hand on my leg and I quickly pulled away. Then he proceeded to look at all three of us and say, I'm sorry for the long ride ladies, I know you've gone out of the way, but you're all too beautiful for me to let you leave so soon. What the fuck dude? I wanted to get out of the car but we were all sat there in silence and all I could think was, Holy fuck, this guy is going to kill us. He made other creepy remarks towards me, commenting on how youthful and full of life I am. Some real serial killer stuff. After sitting there in shock for what felt like hours, my sweet quiet grandma screamed at him telling him to turn around and get back on the highway. He finally pulled off the side of the road and continued on the country road. The whole way he kept looking back at me and making increasingly sexual remarks. About an hour and a half later we got to the grounds and I was extremely shaken up and almost in tears. I wished we had just called another Uber. I hope he doesn't do this to all his female passengers and I will never be taking a ride share again. Uber driver from hell, you made me miss two hours of the show and you scared me half to death. I gave you zero stars and I hope Uber fires you. Let's never ever meet again. I've never really told this story, at least not completely, but it's something that I still think about from time to time and it kind of haunts me. I used to work as a manager at a fast food place in a rather seedy part of a medium-sized city. 
I worked at the nicer location until they decided to transfer me, and there were rumours that the location I ended up getting sent to was going to be shut down, which did end up happening a few years after I'd finally left. Anyway, the point is that the place wasn't being well taken care of. The dining room was dated and the owners were certainly not updating or maintaining the place well. They were barely maintaining the very basic safety requirements, and sometimes they weren't even doing that. For example, I often worked the closing shift, which for this location at the time was 4pm till midnight. Between 7pm and 11pm, it would be me running the drive through and front counter by myself, and one employee running the kitchen. At 11pm that other employee would go home, so I was left by myself to tidy up and do the deposit between 11pm and 12pm. This isn't usually very safe, and I am not sure it was even entirely legal at the time. This was over a decade ago, so who knows. Just to provide a little context and background here, I'm a girl, but I'm not what you would consider small. I'm six foot, and during this time I think people would probably say I came across as more than a little stern. I was younger, but I'd already spent years working in fast food, getting treated like crap by customers, and having drinks and food thrown at me. The location I worked at was a swarm with junkies and drug dealers, and just general scary behaviour. So all this to say, I didn't get ruffled that easily, and I took a lot of things in my stride. However, on this particular night, I was working the night shift with a new guy. He had probably been working there for no more than a few weeks. I'd worked with him a few times before, but never the closing shift, and from the first time I'd met him, I'd always gotten a strange vibe from him. Again, I am not someone who at the time got ruffled easily. Prior to this job, I'd worked with a night janitor at another location. He had an Adderall addiction and a rather unpredictable and scary rage problem. There was also some creepy incel kid who barely spoke more than two words at a time, and when he did, it was always something about how much he disliked women, me in particular. This guy though, this new dude, he was a whole different level of weird. He had a kid and professed to be a single father. He'd brought the kid around during the day, and the kid and his clothing were always really dirty. Like, really dirty. And not only that, but the kid also occasionally had bruises on his head and arms. The kid was a toddler, and I know that toddlers can get into things, but one look at this kid and I knew that those bruises were not from just a little kid messing around. I never saw the new guy behave aggressively towards his kid at all, but I don't know, it was just a feeling, and that feeling translated into other things. I don't know, he was just creepy. It wasn't one thing in particular, it was just a feeling I'd gotten when I was around him. He was a medium height, stocky and quite a young guy. He was totally average in every way, but he just had a vibe about him. He was always friendly, never rude or aggressive, but his eyes were just lifeless, for lack of a better word. Anyway, on this night I think he might have been called in to cover a shift for someone else. I was in charge of making the schedules most of the time and I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have scheduled him to work closing with me, since I found him so off-putting. The first part of the night was fairly normal. I ran the drive through in the front counter, and he ran the kitchen between 8 and 11pm. He would talk to me on and off between orders, telling me about his ex and how he'd come to be a single father. Apparently the mother of his child had a drug problem, but in hindsight, I think a lot of what he said was meant to inspire sympathy. He really laid on the troubled tale of him and his son on thick, but, at the time, I just felt a little bad for both of them. Especially his kid, who I suspected was being abused. But despite being seen as stern, I was definitely still young and naive when it came to manipulative people. He told me that he'd moved to the city and immediately had trouble finding work prior to getting the job at the place we worked at. He said he'd been running out of money and was behind on rent and the bills, and didn't have any formula for his son. At the time, I think I just sympathised with him and said that that sucked. We were both working in fast food and I thought it was obvious that neither of us had any money. The place was bare bones minimum wage and I was barely getting by with three roommates and only pretty much eating the free meal I was given from the restaurant every day. Anyway, he laid it on thick all night, but I don't know that I was really paying all that much attention to it. People tended to ramble on when working at the late shift and I'd gotten used to listening to people spontaneously talk about their personal problems. I had a habit of just listening and not really reciprocating the sharing, and I guess this didn't really go over very well with the new guy. At some point the new guy said something to the effect of, 
You don't talk much, do you? I'm telling you my whole life story here, and you've got nothing to say? I don't know if it was just that I was coming across as unsympathetic, or more likely, it was that he was frustrated that he wasn't successfully manipulating me into giving up personal details about myself. As far as I was concerned, he was just someone I was working with, and I didn't know him. I didn't really want him to know me, and I certainly wasn't about to start telling him anything that wasn't surface-level chit-chat. But the guy was really intimidating, and something about his tone now was off. It definitely wasn't a jokey accusation or an off-the-cuff comment, and I can't remember exactly what I said, but I remember that I just tried to play it off somehow. He didn't say anything more about it, but after that the silence between us seemed a little tense. 11pm came, and it was time for him to go home. The normal procedure was that the kitchen closer would tidy their area, and an actual kitchen cleaner would come in in a few hours to deep clean things. In our case, it was a husband and wife team who did several locations, but they didn't usually come in until a few hours after I'd left, so this guy was only tasked with a basic tidy, and then I would let him out, after which I would stay behind to prepare the deposit. But instead of this happening smoothly, this guy goes into the staff bathroom and stays there, for a long while, like almost 20 minutes or something. I didn't know what was going on, nor did I know exactly how to handle the situation. It had honestly never happened before. Usually people couldn't get out of there fast enough at the end of the night. Was he sick? Did he fall asleep? I didn't know, but I honestly just wanted to get my work done and go home. He finally emerged and quickly walked to the door and left. I was relieved. It was weird, but I just shrugged it off and hurried back to the office to get done what I needed to get done. Not ten minutes later, I started to hear a banging at the back door of the restaurant. Loud, repeated banging. Normally I would ignore this, as the back door faced an alley, and that was right next to a street full of bars and pubs. People leaving the bars and pubs often got the idea that banging on the door would get them after hours food service, because, well, they were drunk. So this wasn't necessarily uncommon. So I just ignored it and kept hurrying to get things done. But the banging did not stop and it somehow just seemed to get louder and louder and more urgent. So I finally got up and went to look out the peephole to see who was there. At this point, I was definitely on edge, and this edginess swelled into a full-out anxiety attack when I saw that it's the new guy standing at the back door. Now, my first thought was to not open the door. I really didn't want to open the door, but I knew that he knew that I was in there. What if he had forgotten something inside? What if it was his house keys, or car keys, or something important? I was going to have to leave the building by that same door at some point, so there really seemed to be no escaping him. So, reluctantly and very stupidly, yes, trust me, I know, I opened the door. What I opened the door to was quite frankly terrifying to me. He said that he'd left his jacket inside, or his keys maybe, I can't remember, and I told him to tell me where they were and I'd go get them. I didn't want him to come inside. If this had been any other person I worked with regularly, this would have been no big deal. I'd let them back in, let them get whatever they'd left behind and they'd take off. But I instinctively knew I didn't want this dude back inside, in the dark, empty restaurant with me. But new dude was not having it. He pushed past me and said he'd get it himself. Then he proceeded to shut himself in the bathroom again. And at this point I just panicked. Instead of just staying there by the door, which in hindsight I should have done, I rushed back to the office. Stupid girl that I was, I had left some of the cash I was counting for the deposit out. Question, what dummy would answer the back door at night at all, and especially with a till out? Well, this girl, I guess. This dumb girl. I managed to stuff the cash in the safe and lock it, though, before he came to find me. The office was dark. It was summer and the air conditioning was on full blast, but this dude was sweating a lot. I was taller than him and I'm not a small girl, but somehow I just knew that this guy was about to hurt me. He was keyed up about something. As I watched his eyes dart around the office, I grabbed my jacket hanging on the hook next to me. I hadn't finished my deposit, but I was getting out of there. I didn't care how much shit I'd get into in the morning for my work not being done. I smiled and told him that I was just leaving and that he could walk me out. I was really just trying to not show my panic as whatever he had planned I wanted to give him an out for him to rethink it. So I smiled, grabbed my purse and started to move towards the door. Now new guy who was standing in the doorway did not budge. He started talking about his son, about the money trouble he'd been having, 
and then capped the whole story off with a request for a loan. From the tone of his voice, it was clear that this was not a loan. What it was, was a demand of money from me. He said he would pay me back as soon as he got paid, and that I'd really be helping him out. I didn't know what to do as he had me trapped. I wasn't leaving the office or the building unless he allowed it. Or at this point, at least, I wasn't leaving without a fight. Something told me that despite the height difference, I wasn't going to win. So I gave him money from my wallet. Fifty dollars, I think. And when I gave it to him, he said, Thanks, you're really helping me and my son out. I won't forget it. But when he said it, he had no expression. No smile, no speech effect at all. He didn't seem grateful or even relieved. Just dead eyes. And his arms limp at his sides. It was terrifying. To this day, I don't remember how I got him to the door. All I remember was shutting the door behind him, making sure the door was securely locked, and rushing into the office to burst into tears. I didn't finish my work, but I stayed in there until I could force myself to leave out of the same door. I was sure he was going to jump me when I left. The thought never occurred to me to call the cops. I don't know why. I guess I just felt like nothing serious had happened yet. He'd asked me for money and I'd willingly given it to him, despite the fact that I felt I had no choice and had been scared shitless. I only saw him one more time after that, but neither of us ever mentioned that night or the money. I don't know why I didn't ask for it back. I think I was embarrassed or scared, or both. I don't know. I don't think I've ever told anyone in my life this story, or at least if I have, I definitely left out the part where I'd gave him the money and never got it back. Pretty quickly after that he stopped showing up to his shifts and I never saw him again. I don't believe in throwing words like psychopath around, as I think people overuse psychological terms like that, making them just synonymous with anyone who has just horribly behaved. There are a lot of varying degrees of terribly behaved people in this world, unfortunately. But after taking a lot of abnormal psych classes, I can say that there was definitely something about this guy's effect that was just wrong, for lack of a better term. I'd smile, he'd smile. I'd frown, he'd frown. It was almost like talking to someone pantomiming emotions. Maybe I'm just remembering it that way because it was such a terrifying experience for me. But the truth is that I've never been comfortable talking about this event, and to this day, when I do think about it, I feel just as uncomfortable as I did the day it happened, more than a decade ago. The head manager at my restaurant did make an anonymous call to child services about the guy's kid, unrelated to my incident, obviously, and I don't know what, if anything, came of it. I like to believe that the reason the new guy stopped showing up was because he got arrested for child abuse and his kid was placed with a family who loved the shit out of him. Maybe that didn't happen, but that's what I like to think. This happened about five years ago. I'm a 5'8 male and at the time I was a regular gym goer and martial artist. I still do martial arts but have less time for the gym. I was making my way to the dojo from my job at the time and decided to take the back roads to get there. I had done this hundreds of times without issue. As I was driving everything was fine until I got to a single lane bridge where there were traffic lights so only one side of traffic could pass. My side was on red and there was one car in front of me. I was waiting for about 30 seconds when a large group of men on scrambler dirt bikes and quad bikes pulled up around my car and in front of the car in front of me. One of the quad bikes hit the back of my car, not too hard but enough to know that it had been. My car was a beat up old little Vauxhall Corsa. I had heard that there had been some attempted carjackings and so I figured I would stay in my car. Yes I do martial arts and yes I can fight but I'm not stupid in thinking I would win against seven guys, some possibly with weapons. The light went green, but the bike blocking the car in front wouldn't move, and they were looking at my crappy little car. Yup, this was happening. I decided to take the initiative and pulled out, nearly hitting one of the bikes, and hit the gas passing the guy at the front. They then gave chase to me, but my only thought was, if I stop or if they run me off the road, then that's it. I was determined that if they tried to do any of those things I would run them over and if I got stopped I would make a good account of myself. As a martial artist I do carry some hand weaponry, mainly short fighting sticks, but they were in the boot of my car. 
I was not going to be able to get them in time if I'd gotten stopped, so I was fully prepared to hit them. I called the police at whilst driving near 80 miles an hour down a winding country road, which fortunately I knew very well, and a lady answered asking what my emergency was. I very calmly explained what was happening and kept my head. She asked where I was and so I told her which road I was on. I also stated that if they try to stop me I will be running them over. Funnily, she said, Okay, sir, but please stay on the line. At this point the bikers were all circling and pointing at me, possibly shouting at me too. I was nearly entering the town my dojo was at. I just needed to keep going. As soon as I crossed the town boundary where there was traffic and people, i.e. potential witnesses, they turned off the main road. They let me be and I explained this to the lady on the line. She said that the police will be watching the area and I didn't hear anything back. I got to the dojo and was really shaken up. I'm going to admit that I was terrified, but my ability to stay calm, focused and not panic is what saved me. I think about what happened every now and again and what would have happened if I had been someone with less confidence or determination, or even if they had stupidly gotten out the car to look at the damage. These thoughts bother me and those idiots make me very angry. Part of me wishes that I could have gone one-on-one -on -one with them and beat the ever-living crap out of them. Fortunately though, I got away. Sadly the car that I was driving died about a month later when the timing chain snapped while I was on the motorway. Basically the engine exploded, but that's another story. I did see them once again, but during the day this time. They came from a small gypsy camp and they were going down another country road. They didn't see me and I never encountered them again. For anyone asking why I didn't report it to the police, the simple answer is that nothing would have been done. Travellers often get wide berth from the police in my country. First some background. I grew up in the deepest region of the biggest city in South America. It's a dangerous place, to the point where I have never met a single adult person who wasn't robbed at least a few times. You know the story that in some places there are a lot of words to describe cocaine because of how prevalent it is. Well in Brazil there are many words to describe a robbery. One particular common type of robbery is called arastao, literally meaning a great dragging. It's when a group of robbers target individuals in a much larger crowd. The sudden scare makes those near the attack run away, and when people see others running scared and screaming, they also start running along, dragging the whole crowd in a single direction, hence the name. The robbers use the ensuing chaos to flee before the cops are called, so it is usually a very brief event. Usually. Back in 2009, I used to travel by subway, and walk for about 10 minutes the rest of the way to college. I studied at night and classes finished at 23.15pm, by which time I would take a bus to return to the subway station because it would be too dangerous to walk this late at night. On November the 10th, around 10pm, I was in class when I noticed all the lights in the building that I could see through the window turned off and soon after the lights in my building would go off as well. I didn't know it at the time, but what happened was a huge blackout that had affected half of Brazil and the entirety of Paraguay for quite a while. Power would gradually return, but things would only become normal the next day, almost eight hours later. Anyway, the generator kicked in, but our teacher dismissed the class because of the blackout. As I was leaving I discovered it was near total darkness outside. Streets were mostly illuminated by the cars on the road so I went to the crowded bus stop and waited. My bus arrived really late, but eventually I reached the subway and this is when things started to go very wrong. Because of the blackout, the subway was not operational and there was already a very large crowd waiting for it to reopen. The building itself was powered by generators, but no one was allowed past the turnstiles until things had gotten back to normal. This was a very warm Brazilian spring night and there was no ventilation in the building. Also, the conglomeration caused it to feel even warmer. The result of this is that the crowd was divided into two, one group waiting inside the hot but lit building, and the other waited outside in the cooler but dark night. By this point you might already have guessed what is going to happen. I was in the group that chose to bake instead of stand in the dark, and the larger group was outside. 
Suddenly I heard a few screams. Then people started to push and squeeze inside. This made the heat almost unbearable, but soon after the commotion had started, it had stopped. Everything became quiet, and the crowd dispersed a little. Then it happened again. A few screams and everyone started to push everyone else inside. Sudden silence, unbearable heat, and the crowd dispersing again. This kept happening, I'm not sure how many times, and I was equally scared and confused. I had no idea what was going on, but I overheard people talking and put the pieces together. I was already familiar with the fact that this region had a lot of beggars by day that turned into muggers at night. They usually acted alone or in small groups, threatening people with shivs and small knives and snatching phones from distracted victims. During the blackout, however, they took advantage of the large crowd and practiced the aforementioned Arastao. What made this unusual, though, is the fact that the crowd could not disperse because we were waiting for the subway. No one would venture far during a blackout and no cops would ever arrive, so it kept happening over and over again. I'm not sure if they were simply snatching phones, using knives or both, but whatever it was, it scared those outside repeatedly, and I eventually managed to call my father and asked him to drive me home. I was almost more scared when I had to walk alone the short distance to where he had parked the car than I was of what was going on inside the station. I was lucky to have someone to drive me home, because as it turns out, the subway would remain closed for a few more hours. I can't imagine having to deal with that situation for that long. I still remember seeing an old lady waiting alone on a secluded bus stop in near complete darkness during my drive home. She was probably even more scared than I was that night. It's hard to even imagine. I also hope those opportunistic robbers got what they deserved in the end. But knowing Brazil, I highly doubt it. This happened on a Thursday during my second semester, and I was in senior year. I had just gotten out of US history, and I was walking out of the building to my next class when a teacher called everyone in the hall into her classroom and locked the door. We were in there for a very long time and we didn't know what was happening. I was with two of my friends, so we were just talking. An hour had passed and we started to become uneasy. Someone in the room said that there had been a shooting as a joke. People on Facebook kept asking what was going on and people were texting their parents to see if they knew what was happening. Somehow, someone found out that someone had robbed the gas station next door and that they were headed towards the school. The way the campus is set up, there's seven buildings and all are labelled as letters. I was in building B, which happened to be the closest to the gas station. We also found out from the news that someone had called earlier that day to say that they were going to bomb the school. Now I'm a true crime junkie, and I'd like to think I would know what to do in situations like these. I'm pretty good in a crisis. My philosophy is to concentrate on getting out of danger, then you can break down once you're safe. I've had to do that just a few times, and this wasn't any different. I knew that if there was a bomb, we would all be evacuated, and I knew since there was someone with a gun coming to the school, all of us leaving the buildings, it would be easy to kill us. I tried to think of a plan. Where I was in the room, I was closest to the closet. I had desks around me, and I decided if something happened, I would flip a desk over to hide me, and then get in the closet. Luckily though, I didn't have to do anything, because the guy was arrested on his way. By the time we got out of lockdown, a lot of parents, news trucks, police and ambulances were there. My mum was there and I had been panicking to her over text. My mum was pissed. She had called the school to see about getting me because I was having a panic attack and the truancy officer told her that she couldn't pick me up because of a panic attack and that nothing was happening as we were in an active lockdown. She went to chew him out and we were standing in a crowded hallway as people were going back to class as usual. The truancy officer left the room mid-conversation, and the secretary let my mum sign me out and we left. I found out later the bomb threat was a few freshmen making a joke, and they got expelled. Hey fizz and friends. Just want to give a big shout out to my one and only subscriber to Patreon, Fire05. Thank you for being there, 
and if anyone else is interested in early access to all recordings that you can also download, then click on the Patreon link in the description and subscribe for only $1 a month. I love you all, and remember, keep being creepy.